Hey, today I'm going to show you how you can crush your opponents, regardless of what they do, with the same setup. Let's take a look at the first example, the game between Bruzon against Anand. White plays pawn on d4, we're talking about the Queen's pawn game. Like goes knight of 6, knight of 3, pawn to e6, pawn to e3. This is the beginning of the white setup. And the good thing about this is that it's super simple and very practical and also aggressive. It's kind of not really like a typical opening where you need to memorize a lot of variations, but more of a scheme, a setup that you need to remember. And after that, you can execute this setup all the time. So here, the point of the white's plan is that they go pawn to b3, preventing black potentially from pushing their pawn forward and attacking the bishop. And white is going to put the both bishops here. Once one bishop will be standing on d3, looking towards the black's future castle. And similarly, the dark squared bishop will aim towards the similar uh, direction as well and it allows white to develop a strong attack later in the middle game so that is basically the setup black goes bishop d6 white castles black castles white goes bishop b2 knight to c6 and knight goes to d2 white does not want to develop these knight to c3 because from here it'll, it would block the way of the bishop and that is why they put the knight on d2 so that the dark squared bishop keeps being active along this diagonal Black decided to trade pawns on d4 and he goes pawn to b6 to develop their bishop. At this point white played a prophylactic move pawn to a3 so that black can never jump with their knight to b4 and attack the bishop. Black goes bishop b7 and at this point white goes knight to e5. White kind of finalized his development and now he's transitioning to the attack and therefore he starts moving his pieces to the black's territory and he wants to gradually develop an attack against the black's king. The move knight to e5 is a very typical beginning of the white's attack, as it's really a multi-purpose move. It completely blocks the center so that black can never push their pawn forward. It also it cuts away this bishop from d6 so that it does not uh, you know, really attack anything in the white's territory. It also allows white in the future to push the f-pawn forward and thus to advance further on the king side. Therefore, knight e5 is a really key move which allows white to develop his attack against the black's king, and it is the beginning of this attack. On a side note, there are a few other common tactical patterns, uh, traps, that uh, white can use in the queen's pawn game, and if you want to know them, you can also check out my other video, 7 best traps for blitz and bullet. I'll link it below the video in the description, because there you can find a few more of those practical things. Anyway, let's move on with the game. Uh, Anand played queen to c7, trying to eliminate this knight from e5, but certainly white does not want to trade it off. Instead, white wants to keep it there, so white plays queen to e2 to provide this additional protection for the knight. And black played knight to e7. Black realizes that white is gonna probably attack on the king side, and so he brings his knight closer so that he can possibly go to g6 or maybe to f5, and uh, doing so, black is bringing up reserves closer to the black's king. White plays pawn to f4 to solidify the knight on e5, and also potentially to give way to the rook so that it can be transposed to the king side to attack the black's king, and black goes pawn to b5. Black is trying to look for the counterplay on the queen side, but it's really hard to do anything there, really. Right now, he's trying to seduce white by capturing the pawn, but of course, it's not even the sacrifice, because if white were to capture the pawn, black would recapture the pawn immediately, but also putting some pressure here on the second rank, and definitely that is not what white wants. Therefore, let's take a move back. White did not capture the pawn. Instead, he just continued with his plan. He plays rook to f3, so the rook is ready to, to be moved against the black's king. Black plays rook c8, he's still trying to somehow counterattack there. On the queen side, white played rook c1, perhaps he was a little bit worried about his queen side position, so he decided to protect it, even though perhaps it was not that much necessary. Black played b4, trying to open up the position there, and white just decided to shut it down, because he wants to keep the position in the center and on the queen side closed, so that he can focus all of his forces against the black's king. Black goes knight g6, trying to cover it, and white plays rook c to f1, so that all of his pieces are really concentrated against the black's king. And that is like the simplicity of this setup. You know your plan, you know your setup, and then you just execute. Basically, regardless of what black does. That's why I said earlier that this setup for white is extremely efficient and also simple. Black plays knight to e4. 
he is still trying to seduce White to deflect from his plan. And at this point, if I would try to win the pawn here on e4, it still doesn't work for the same reason. At the end of the line, if we imagine this massive exchange on e4, at the end of the line, black recaptures the pawn on c2, as well as starts attacking something on the white's position. The queen, the bishop, and the white's attack is over. Therefore, that's not the line white want to go for. I took a few moves back here. In the real game, white did not take the knight on e4, instead he just played rook h3 once again, simply continuing with his plan. Anand played pawn to f5 to fix his knight on e4, and at first it looks like black is doing perfectly okay, but the problem is white already developed a too strong pressure against the black's king. And now after white traded the knight here on e4 and jumped with his queen to h5. All of a sudden black finds himself in trouble, as right now queen takes h7 is a real threat, it's checkmate in one. And there is not much black can do against it, as he can't really move the pawn forward. If he does it, then the knight on g6 is hanging and white can simply capture it. Therefore black is kind of defenseless already. So Anand decided to go for the counterattack. He trades on e5, and after that captures the pawn on c2, so that he also has some threats against white's minor pieces. But White's attack is already going, so he can just continue. He goes here rook to g3. He does not protect his minor pieces on the queen side because he's got a lot of nice targets on the king side. Still, black cannot really protect his king side, so I just capture the knight, trying to look for some counterplay. And at this point, white played a nice move. Rook takes g6, not queen takes, because even though it looks more natural to take a knight with a check, taken with a queen, but in this case, in fact, it allows the black's king to escape. And if white tries to capture another pawn here, then rook to f7 covers the king and black is doing fine. Therefore, let's take a few moves back here. After queen to d2, instead of capturing here on, with a queen, white actually correctly captured with a rook. And now black is in a real trouble, because now white can take the pawn either with a queen or with a rook, and both threats are really strong, so black has to play rook to g8. Temporarily, it still looks like black is holding the position, even though white is uh, pressuring black, but it looks like black is holding. And maybe Annette was hoping that he can keep the position, but white found another brilliant sacrifice. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it, to check if you can find it yourself, or you may pause the video and think about this. He, white found a way to break through the black's defense with a brilliant sacrifice. Rook takes e6, so that white wants to completely eliminate this pawn shield around the black's king, so that white can directly checkmate the king later. And after king takes, queen takes f5, king goes back to e7, queen to f7 check, chasing the black's king, king d8, and at this point white can already capture either the rook or the bishop here on b7, but instead he decided to go for the checkmating attack, playing pawn to e6, threatening queen to d7 checkmate. And at this position, White is clearly winning, because he's threatening Quinto de Seon, or even taking the rook, or maybe pushing the pawn. There are too many threats. Somehow, Anand played pawn to e3 and resigned after that. I don't really know why he did that that way, but anyway, White's winning. Now let's see how you can utilize the similar setup playing black. But before we move on to this game, let me also invite you to check out my free masterclass, the best way to improve a chess instantly, where we go beyond certain openings, and I'm showing you in general how to improve your chess. And it already helped to a lot of students, not only to become local champions, but even to become masters and grandmasters. So you may really wish to check this out by clicking the link below the video. And let's come back to the game. It's the game between Gerasimov against Maslov. Smyslov was one of the world champs, but during this game he was only a 14 years old teenager. Pretty strong even though, because in this particular tournament he actually won it with a perfect score, getting 11 points out of 11 games, which is a rare thing in the chess history. So as we can see right now, white is trying to use the similar setup, and black is so far doing more or less the same thing, but at this point black already played an interesting move. He played queen to c7, and you may wonder why to play queen to c7 instead of doing something more traditional like such as castling. But the point here is that queen c7 does not allow the white knight to jump to e5. As we seen in the previous game, going with the white knight to e5 allows white to expand on the king side and then potentially fixing the knight there with a pawn from f4 
it really blocks the black's position and therefore black plays queen c7 kind of prophylactic move so that the white's knight cannot jump there as in this case black would just uh, take it. There is another hidden idea behind this move. If white just continues his setup by playing knight to d2, in this case black can trade the pawns on d4 and jump with his knight on b4. And now you can see that the black's queen from c zone is also performing an attacking function, because now, with the help of the knight and the queen, black is putting pressure on the bishop as well as c2 pawn. And the bishop cannot go away, because then the pawn will be lost, which allows black to trade off this powerful attacking piece of white the bishop, getting some positional advantage. Therefore, queen c zone, I should say, is a really tricky move for black. However, in the game, white was prudent, and instead of this, he played pawn to a3 here to cover this b4 square so that the knight cannot jump there anymore. And therefore, black also just continued his development, b6 and pawn to b7. Funnily enough, both players executed a similar setup where both of the bishops are pointing towards the opponent's king, which already gives us the sign that it's gonna be a sharp attacking game later on. White played knight to c3, he is aiming for knight b5 to attack the queen and the bishop, so black protects the square, white goes rook e1, perhaps not the best move, but it's more or less okay, and black traded pawns on d4 and castled. At this point, white decided that he needs to do something active and played knight to a4. He was probably going for the advancement pawn of c5, trying to disturb black there, but a little piece of advice, usually at the beginning of the middle game, you need to bring your rooks into play. If you are not sure what to do, just bring your rook, or okay? Because otherwise, your rook on a1, such a powerful piece, is doing nothing. It's kind of like um, you're really helping your opponent to have advantage of active pieces in the game if you're not utilizing all the pieces you have. And that is why playing rook to c1 was probably much better. Anyway, in the game, white played knight to a4. And because anticipating this advancement c5 for taking the bishop, black played bishop f4 to remove the bishop from this potential attack immediately, and white played knight to e5, which again looks active, white player is really trying to push here, but black found a really hidden way to develop a sudden attack. First of all, he traded on c4, which opens up the diagonal for this light squared bishop. After that, he traded the knight, and now this bishop is really open, and now instead of moving the knight somewhere, he goes queen c6. And you can already see that this bishop on b7 starts being super powerful. Now queen takes g2 is a real threat. One has to cover that square, so he goes bishop f1. And once again, instead of moving the knight somewhere, black found a counter-attacking move, a counter-blow. And if you have been watching my videos, then you probably know this idea, fence is the best defense, and you really want to always look for the counter-attacking moves instead of automatically moving your attack piece away. Black played rook to d8, attacking the queen. White played queen b3, simultaneously also attacking the pawn on b6 with his queen and knight, but black is not gonna defend, he goes knight g4. All of a sudden, all of the black's pieces started to point towards the white's king. But we know that it's not really a certain coincidence, because it was the whole point of the black's setup, to start putting pressure against the opponent's king. Now, white needs to protect the pawn, so he played pawn to h3. And at first, it may seem like black is in trouble here, actually, because the knight is attacked here, the pawn on b6 is still hanging, and white seems to be holding the position around his king, so it kind of looks like black is in trouble, actually, if he has to move his knight backwards all the way to h6. But black found a brilliant shot here. Rook to d3. Brilliant counter-attacking move, putting the rook under two potential captures here, but both of them actually fail. Bishop to d3 is not possible due to queen takes g2 checkmate. So that is pretty clear. What if white captures with a queen? Which looks like a better option. In this case, it turns out to be a decoy because after bishop h2, king to h1, there is knight takes f2. And now we can see why it was so important for black to keep the white's queen exactly there on d3. Because now, due to this fog, after king takes and knight takes d3, black wins the queen. White still cannot capture this knight because of queen takes g2 checkmate. And otherwise, black is just having too strong pressure, he already won the queen, and he's attacking a whole lot on the white's position here, so that is clearly losing for white. The white player was quite resourceful, and he played queen takes b6 instead, he also wants to counterattack. he's attacking here the black spaces on the queen side, 
the Black's rook on d3 is still under the attack as well. But Black found another brilliant move. Rook takes h3. Wow, what a move. What's the point? Well, it's fairly clear to see what's gonna happen after pawn takes h2 here. Black even has a, a, a nice choice between bishop to h2 checkmate or queen to h1 checkmate. Both of these moves is checkmate in one, therefore that clearly does not work for white. What if they try to trade off the queens? It's usually a good idea for an opponent to trade off the queens when they are under an attack. In this case, bishop h2 followed by knight takes f2, another beautiful checkmate with a knight. And now there, here comes the final question which I want to ask you. What if white plays here bishop to d4, the move that was played in the game? From here the bishop protects potentially the queen as well as the f2 pawn and it's still not that easy for black to find the winning continuation. So please think about this and if you can find it then please write it down in the comments below. Black has the way to win the game but it's not that simple so let's see if you can find it. Also if you have any questions about the setup known as Kali Tsukurator system feel free to post it in the comments below as well. I'll try to answer some of them. And um, now you can either join our free masterclass, the best way to improve a chess instantly, or you may wish to check out my other video, which I mentioned earlier, seven best traps for Blitz and Bullet, where I also go over some other common attacking patterns in the Queen's Pawn game.